hello everyone. Um, I'd just like to uh, do a quick welcome um, to uh, the Columbia GSAP Advanced Studio 6 Faculty Projects Talks um, session. So this is a type of session that's part of our series of studio-wide events and it's meant to explore connections between professors work in their offices and the studio topics um, in that professor's exact studio and studio-wide topics. More specifically, in recent semesters, we've been exploring the themes of architecture and environment on the one hand, and maybe more uh, in a more focused way, climate change at the building scale. Um, and in this particular talk, I think we're gonna see some great examples of that kind of work and that kind of thinking um, uh, from some people who you know well. So Stephen Hall of Stephen Hall Architects and Matthias Schuler of Transolar um, need no introduction uh, in this school, in this context. And I'm very happy to welcome them to uh, you know, generously give us their time for this lecture entitled Ecologics at Stephen Hall Architects, 1992 to 2020. So welcome Stephen and Matthias. Thank you. We have a small video. Matthias is coming from Stuttgart, and it's what time is it there in Stuttgart? Uh, it's eleven thirty in the evening. All right. So he he's uh, you know going to the well for us, and I have a four minute video which shows you where this is coming from, and then we would, we can start the talk. Let's let's start with that four minute video if we can play that, showing you. Uh, I made this video for the Italians in a couple of uh, architecture schools wanted to know what we're doing at this moment. This is my watercolor hut right at the edge of Round Lake. We're looking at a 29 acre spring fed lake in the woods. This is the little tesseract edition of this house from 1952 was made in 2001 and that's my studio in the center that big window that looks out. And here in the foreground is the podium for T-Space Poets readings. It's, this is a design studio for my painting and my architecture. And we're busy on a project right now in Korea for a school. And this is the site plan, it's a competition. It's a school for uh, underprivileged teenagers in Korea. Competition that's due in about four weeks. So I'm in the middle of doing drawings for this. And some of the earlier drawings here you can see in watercolors. And the way I work is I, I draw on these five by seven watercolor pads and then we, I take a picture of them and send them to my team in Beijing and my team in New York. And we're very happy to be working on this competition. We also have a project that went back on site in Shanghai. This is a health center and a cultural center in Shanghai. People are back on site on the construction site. So it's very exciting um, project going on. And we're doing a, a prison initiative pavilion for BARD. Right over here, you can see some models. These are some of the study models. And I just presented this virtually uh, last week to Leon Botstein, the president and the trustees at BARD. This is a little prison initiative pavilion that will also have an exhibition space and, 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 and a public uh, event space at Montgomery Place in Rhein, near, near Rhinebeck. So one of the great things about working up here is I do everything. You can see the wonderful view from my table. Here's my table. And I get up early in the morning and work on five by seven watercolor pads. There's the Korea project. And I work on these and then we send them to the team and then they send back three dimensional views. You can see the projects that are going on in our office. The Franklin and Marshall Fine Arts Building, that site has been delayed because of the virus. The Institute for Advanced Studies in Princeton that site is on delay because of the virus. The Museum of Fine Arts in Houston. iCarbon X 
in Shenzhen is back on site and under construction. That's our archive building here, which has just been finished. Taiwan uh, Necropolis is back under construction. This is the building I showed you earlier, the health center and uh, cultural center in Shanghai is back under construction. These are competitions that we recently lost. This is building that is not is on hold right now. We're also working on the Dublin uh, Creative Design Center in Dublin, Ireland, and a concert hall that we won in Ostrava, Czech Republic. Those projects are going on because they have schedules and everything is being done online. So the people are working in teams, working very well with Zoom, and we have weekly meetings. So all of our deadlines have not been postponed because of the crisis. Uh, so those things are going on. So we're very fortunate to have a global operation where some things are in Asia and are coming back on and other things are in Europe and they're in certain, uh, let's say, categories. But I think it's also a time of reading. And I've been reading, uh, for example, the poems of Paul Celan, a rather dark figure, but I think the poetry is is appropriate, or even the homage to Robert Frost by Joseph Brodsky, or Rilke. Rilke is always great at a time of rethinking things, and I think that's the kind of time we're in. So, uh, Matthias, we're so glad that you're joining us, and what I was hoping is that, like on many of these, there's a lot of technical, we're gonna do uh, quite a number of projects quite rapidly. I think it should be taking 30 minutes. So I just want to read something that I wrote this morning. Ecologic is a time I invented the bracket of environmental architectural work since 1998. And we have pushed these projects ecologically resisting all fossil fuels. In our current crisis, we must not forget the fight for our global climate. Perhaps we are inside the moment of a revolution-like action. If the French Revolution, according to Hegel, for the first time, man dared to turn himself upside down, to stand on his head and on thought and to build reality according to it. Now, it's nature, it's a natural history we, are, we need to wake up to. And Hannah Arendt wrote, modern philosophy, starting with Hegel, has succumbed to the strange illusion that man, in distinction from all other things, has created himself. And I like what Arvo Park, the composer, said to a Spanish newspaper, I think it was yesterday, the coronavirus has shown us that humanity is a single organism. And he said, in a way, it has sent us all back to the first grade. Anyway, I would go now chronologic, in reverse chronology, the projects get bigger and bigger. Of course, this is just uh, according to the chronology. This is just just finished, and it's our architectural archive and research library. Um, we built uh, based on an idea of bracketing, which means it threads through the trees, and we had to build this super economically. So I acted as the engineer, the architect, and I'm sorry to say, Matthias, I was the HVAC engineer. <laughs> You know, I decided on a single well, 500 feet deep, which was a closed loop, a new, uh, where a bundle of fingers takes the, the temperature and it's work. And, and, but I took all the lessons we learned in the exit in house, the radiant concrete floors, six inches on center with the correct insulation. I'm very proud to say that this building is performing brilliantly on a single well. It, it, was, it was about 10 degrees outside and it was like 72 degrees inside. The walls are uh, super insulated. There's a minimum number of windows. The, the Velux skylights were donated by the Velux Corporation. But you see that concrete radiant floor is riding on an insulation slab. And once that uh, building heats up, the geothermal well maintains the heat. So here in Rhinebeck, also in, in Princeton, we're doing the rooms and commons uh, for the advanced study. This is a place where Einstein uh, served his last 10 years. It's a very important building. Uh, David Rubenstein uh, uh, donated and it was based on the concept of space curves, the notion of, of, of a space that 
is made up of two intersecting curves. So the whole pavilion then is geothermal heated and cooled with 20 wells. Right, Matthias? 20 wells? Yes, 20 wells, yes. And Matthias led this one all the way through. And uh, it's been a little bit delayed right now due to our, our problem with the class, but it's going to be opening probably in about six months. And there you see the inside from a couple of weeks ago. And this is a very prominent position. It's on Einstein Drive. So in a way, it's, it's merging with the landscape and it'll redefine that entrance to the Institute for Advanced Studies. I'm very honored to have won this in a competition against some very important other architects. There you can see a diagram of Matthias's work. Do you want to say anything to that diagram, Matthias? Yeah, it, it, it is certainly shows the connection on one side. We see the closed loop of the geothermal system and we connect to improve the efficiency of the heat pump it with radiant systems. So we have radiant floors for heating and cooling because with the lowest heating temperature and the highest cooling temperature, we can serve the rooms uh, by this radiant system. And I think that's quite important that you always connect the source to the related system. Well, there's a little, uh, a drone <laughs> view from a few, a few weeks ago. This is the Kennedy Center. Um, in fact, if you go on Instagram today, you'll see we just posted a new film of this. I think it's about, how long is that film? About 10 minutes? Anyway, this was a, a really exciting competition to win against, I won't name the names, and our, our concept was to, instead of adding on to the 1972 building uh, against it, to go underground and link everything by in the design process, we couldn't float the pavilion from our competition entry that we, we proposed to float in the Potomac River. And I made this sketch. Um, I made this sketch and I had to show this. You can see now that at the bottom, the river pavilion is up on ground. But we got a bridge connecting over, over the, the, the highway. So we got our river riverside connection. And I made this. I made this sketch, and Deborah, Deborah Rutter, the director of the museum, said, "You have to speak to the main donor, David Rubenstein." And I, I said, "Okay." And he came at 9:30 one morning, and I showed him the sketch. I said, "I have to move this up on the grade, and, and, but it's going to be served below." But another good thing is, all three of these buildings are going to work better environmentally. And and then David said, "All right, we'll do it." What else? Do you need anything else? And I said, well, if you want the great details that I like to do, I need another $12 million. And he said, okay. And he left. That's a great client, by the way. And, and this is, these are, these are, you want to say something about this, Matthias? Yeah, I think in this case, what is quite interesting, we do a geothermal system, but we are as well connecting it uh, to the river, which is as well at the moment serving uh, the, the existing museum. So it's kind of the the river was always the source of the energy for the existing museum and we kind of connected it to the ground to serve now the extension. And as I said, you can see a much more thorough vi vi uh, film just released about the whole concept of the building. These are the glissando curves that indicate the building is connected down below. And that's the structural concrete. I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a student of Kenneth Frampton. I believe that structure ought to have an expression in the architecture. And this one is certainly all the structures expressed, white, white structural concrete. And in, in the interior, we developed a new kind of concrete. These are the bearing walls for the holding up the landscape above, but we developed this acoustic crinkled concrete. And, and, and Garrick Ambrose was, doing experiments, we made these rubber forms, but the depth of the, the, the concrete allows for that kind of amazing acoustic vibration in that auditorium. And it's the largest green roof, I think, in Washington, D.C., and you see the position here in the diagram of the geothermal wells. Recycled water in the pools. Yeah, and I think as well, the big advantage putting 
most of the program below ground is as well you are kind of buffering between the warmer inside and the outside because you don't lose energy in winter against the very cold outside or in summer gain energy from the hot outside because you're buffered in between by the cloud. Okay, this is the Institute for Contemporary Art uh, at Richmond, Virginia. It was a competition we won and this was a very conservative town, you know, Richmond. Uh, so we were very surprised how well they supported our project. They were great clients. And, and it's at the biggest intersection in Richmond, the most busy intersection. So we wanted the, 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 the sort of intersection front of the building to express that torsion and that movement of the intersection. And then we thought about its program, which is a contemporary art. And we decided to make forking galleries. And I said that they're, they're, they're today, instead of art being a kind of grand narrative, like it was during abstract expressionism or like it was during conceptual art even. There is no grand narrative in art today. It's a kind of forking time where someone working in sculpture uh, like Richard Serra or someone working in video like David Atkin or someone painting like, like uh, Bryce Martin or anyone. I mean, the idea is that forking time is where we are. So that the, the, the building kind of folds on the plane of the present here. But this was also a big stretch because they'd never done geothermal wells in, in Richmond, Virginia. Matthias, did you want to say something about this? Yeah, okay, we were not on this, but I think it's, it's clear that in this more, let's call it conservative parts, it's a battle in a circle. And I think Stephen, in this case, you are quite a convincing supporter for us yeah. engineers. If the, if the architect is convinced this and Stephen, in one project we will see later, even Stephen even put it, put it in his money to convince a client. Right, right, <laughs> right. No, we, we, we had a very great client. So there were a lot of resistance people uh, on the various, uh, you know, various client groups, but the main client of doctors, and it's working perfectly, by the way, the, the system of 40 wells is working perfectly. Everyone wants to come and see the basement and see how this system works. There's just some views. There's the galleries, the fourteen time galleries. There's the diagram wells going off, and so they're not under the building. They're, they can be accessed in the garden and the green roofs, and, and it re, and it receives lead platinum, the highest leads. There's recycled water at the water garden at the cafe. This is the this is the university side. The building has two fronts, like a Janus figure. This is the main entrance from the university. At the Lewis Center for Arts in Princeton, a competition we won, uh, I think in 2007, it took 10 years to build this because the moving of the Dinky train and a lot of other things happening in the local town and the fighting of the university in the town. But finally, due to a great client, uh, uh, a great president we, we, and a great, a great donor, um, Peter Lewis, we, we got this through. So, Matthias, you were you were involved on this one, right? No, we were we were watching it from outside. Okay, so basically, it's a it's a forum uh, below a water garden that connects the three buildings, the dance pavilion. There, there, each one has their own idea, a thing within a thing for the dance pavilion, embedded for the poetry and literature, and suspended, the individual practice rooms suspended over the collective collective of the orchestral practice hall. And it's a lead silver building. It has 140 wells, recycled water pool, green roofs, high performance envelope. And it was a great client. Noyati no uh, ran this one and, and uh, it was a long process, but now everybody's very happy with the project. And as it started to unfold, they invited us to do all the interior furnishings. So we did carpet designs and, and, and there's the wells diagram. So in this case, we had a very constricted site and a lot of the wells are practically, they're under parts of the building. And which is fine, yeah, which is fine because to really you don't need to access this well. You don't, right, you don't need, I mean, that's a common misunderstanding that you really don't need any maintenance on these things. The maintenance is only on the water furnace, right? The yes. Right. 
You may oh. change the heat pump after 20 years, but a right. geothermal well can easily run for 50, 80, 100 years. Right. And there you see the suspended practice rooms suspended on steel rods in tension over the orchestral practice room. And this is a house uh, which I convinced this client who <laughs> has too much money to make it totally a green, a green building. So it has all green roofs. We call it pointer villa. It's kind of a, 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 it has a kind of texture. That's a structural concrete on the outside. And Matthias, you weren't involved in this one either, right? No, no. So it, it went on for a long, a long time, uh, about 10 years, in fact. It starts in 07. It has 44 geothermal wells, a green roof, high performance, clear and translucent, um, and, and below thermal mass construction reduces energy. And it, again, the client allowed us to do the furniture, the cabinetries, all the details, which I love to do in architecture. I think that the, the, the light and the space, but then also the detail. There you see the diagram of the 44 geothermal wells. And that's the landscape. We also worked with, we did the main landscape working with Ed, Ed Hollander, and it's a beautiful condition on the edge of the Hudson River. This is our guest house at T Space. It's, a 915 square foot house with a single geothermal well, but this, this one is open loop. And uh, there's also a video about this that you can see if you're interested in the concept, but it's a recycled glass facade, a solar flex panel roof, a natural unfinished locally sourced wood of diaphragm construction and 3D cornstarch based light fixtures. And there you can see all natural wood on the inside and the corn starch printed lights fixtures from our office. And Matthias worked on this one, right Matthias? Right, yes, yes, I think. And you know what I decided, this is just about a thousand feet away from the archive building and I decided to do one closed loop deeper well and I think that was a better decision than what we did here. Yeah, but it, it's it is certainly you you learn you learn right. and you improve and depending on the site, either an open or a closed loop is better. We had eight hundred and fifty. I, I don't know what is it, eighty gallons per minute or something like that on the underwater. Once we did anyway, we knew we learned we learned about this, but this is working fine. Uh, but we had to replace the main water furnace. I tried to economize. We didn't have much money. And I, I, I opted for a, a, a $3,000 unit and it, I, I went back last year and put in a $6,000 water furnace that cools and heats and that works perfectly now. So that makes it a much better house. This is, a, this is in Chengdu, 2012. The largest project I think we've ever done. It approaches 4 million square feet, offices, apartments. The main idea is it's the, the client was always building a tower and an office tower and a condominium tower on a big base, which was a shopping center, closed with closed surfaces. And our idea was to turn that around completely and make an integral urban space, a big shaped public space. Matthias, did you work on this? Yeah, yeah, we worked on it. And I think it was quite uh, a battle to convince the client to do this 455 wells. And luckily in this case, because this was in the, in the times the design during the world uh, crisis in 2008, I think the decision to do the wells was made already before the crisis came. So they had already digged the wells and right. so the system survived even the economical crisis. Right. And this also contains the only built work of Lebius Woods, my good friend, the late Lebius Woods, the Pavilion of Light, which I saved from a, a difficult client. They wanted to take this out. And I said, wait a minute, you can't take this out. This is the light fixture that lights the public plaza. So they, they had to build it. There you see the diagram. But you, this is your diagram, right? Right. It's our diagram showing as well that 
building, Stephen, as you did it, building around the, the edge of the site, this gives us as well more access to daylight for all the program in the towers. I think that's as well a main important point and even keeping a big natural litten plaza in the middle of the site. There you see a diagram of the geothermal wells. There are three sub-basements. So you can see this below the construction site when they're doing these wells. This is a decision you had to make because they were moving fast in the construction. So, and then the sub-basement on top of a sub-basement goes on. So every, every geothermal well is under the building in this case. Yeah. There you see how deep the three sub-basements, you know, the shopping centers are also down low. Matthias, you want to talk to this one? No, no, I think it's only that this, I think the success that we could convince as well the client that we had a, a quite good reference project from uh, Linked Hybrid. So we could refer them to a client which was totally convinced about such a geothermal system. But moving from, uh, from Beijing down to Chengdu was quite a, because the climate is quite different. Right. So, but it, we could, still could convince the clients. I think this was a great development. Right. There you see the, the, the water pond with the skylight that lights the shopping center below, a glass in the bottom of each one of those water ponds that are part of our landscape that brings natural light to the shopping center. And their structural frame is exposed. That's a, a, the earthquake bracing on a, a, a concrete frame. This is a gallery and house in Seoul, Korea. Um, opened in 2012, a great client, the Diang Shipping Company, um, Mr. Tu. And it's a project which was very ideal, like a little utopia. So there's a water garden that's at the heart of it, a house and a guest house. And it has geothermal heating and cooling, green and recycled water pools, and natural light to all spaces, even all the spaces below. You see the entrance pavilion. When you come in the entrance pavilion, you're standing where that guy is standing. You can see that main house on the, on the right, on his right, and the, the guest house on his left. So you're inside, but you're looking at an outside that's looking at two other insides. We also did many of the pieces of furniture and selected the furniture. So it was a wonderful client. And there you see the context in Seoul, Korea. And here's the project that Matthias was talking about, the Herning Museum of Contemporary Art a project that we won in a competition in 2006. So it was, went on very rapidly. There you see in the, to the left, a shirt factory turned into a museum. Once was a shirt factory in the shape of a collar. So we had the idea because they had the largest collection of Piero Manzini. We, Manzoni, we had uh, the idea of shirt sleeves draped over two boxes as the main concept that would bring light on their curves. And at this point, Holger Reinberg, who picked us in the competition, he was a wonderful client, but you know, at this point we were nearing the, the, the breaking ground of the site and, and uh, we had just a few months to go in the drawings and he was resisting and resisting the geothermal well system. And I said, listen, Holger, I believe in this. You know, it works, this is, this is the future. No more fossil fuels, let's do geothermal. I believe in this so much, I'm gonna give $25,000 out of my fee towards these wells. And I was surprised that he took it. <laughs> but, but Stephen named it in the opening of the museum. So right. That's what's right. <laughs> right, when he opened the museum, he was so proud that this is the first geothermally heated and cooled museum in Denmark. And I think, it, 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 yeah, and Denmark is so privileged in respect of geothermal because they have such a high groundwater level. So you easily tap down and take it from the ground and reject it. So when there are two wells, it's not a closed loop system, it's an open loop system. We take the water out and reject it further away. And we are again using similar what we saw in the US projects. We are using it to condition the floor. So it's mainly. Uh, Floor heating and cooling system in combination with a, a displacement ventilation where the air comes out of the ground, out of the floor, mm -hmm. was grilled along the walls to condition the space very carefully where the light comes from the top. 
And there you see natural uh, uh, water ponds that reflect in the landscape. We also did the landscape here. I worked for four years as a landscape architect at Lawrence Halpins in San Francisco. And I, I always feel that landscape and architecture are integral. And you need to think about them right from the beginning. This is our linked hybrid project in uh, 2009. Um, this is a project that I think was the first one that Matthias and I did together. Is that right, Matthias? Right, right, Stephen, yeah. So I remember it. this is like a very ideal project because the client, you know, this was on the way to the Olympics, the 2008 Olympics, and they wanted to show off the greenest possible building they could build. And, and so they went a full distance on anything. And then it, we really had to call Matthias to the, to the table and take some risks here because nothing like this had ever been done anywhere in China. In China. Mm -hmm. You want to talk about it, Matthias? No, no, no. I think this was quite as well. Uh, and Stephen, and that's as well my compliment for you that you were open. We hadn't worked before together that you took the risk. And it took me to go with such a radical solution. On the other side, I think, especially this nice combination of the geothermal system to the water pond in the center to the combination of the external shades. So in a certain way, it's all and the slab, the integrated slab heating and cooling. So it was all so integrated that for the client at the end, it was impossible to take one element out because the whole system would have collapsed. And there you see the recycled water ponds. And I was nervous about that because I thought they might smell because that's all the gray water from the apartments. But the, there's an ultraviolet zapping tank that takes away all the bacteria from the apartment water before it hits the pond. And then there's natural uh, plants, uh, water lilies and all. So it doesn't smell at all. And this water, this whole pond system runs all year round. So they ice skate on it in the wintertime. There you see the diagram. 660 geothermal wells, 100 meters deep. No system like that had ever been done in China. This was a huge risk. What is, and what is very interesting on this, that the client, which at the end, be totally convinced with this concept from there on in all his projects, right. now doing geothermal all over in China. So kind of, and I think this is like, we should spread the news or we should spread Kind of the concept that we convince a client that the client takes us and he builds this project without Stephen and without us but he learned that geothermal connecting to the ground absolutely makes sense there's a there's a diagram of the gray water system the toilet flushing and the pond water the gray water treatment system and this this is your diagram right exactly so we calculated on we showed this is our like three three uh, three year cycle because the question was could we, in a certain way, make sure we get all the heat we dump during summertime into the ground out for the heating in winter? So you have to balance the system. And therefore, the, finally, the connection to the pond in the center, that the pond in springtime, we are using the pond to reset our geothermal system to make sure we are starting every year with the same temperature and it doesn't get warmer and warmer because you get a bit more cooling in teaching than eating. So even in sis, such kind of systems, you have to think on a balance, that you are not getting it out of the balance, that you take enough heat out, the same amount you're dumping in during summertime. There you see the typical installation of the radiant floors, mm -hmm. tubes floating over insulation, very close together. And that's your diagram as well. Matthias. Right. And, and, and you see, it's not a floor system, it's a slab system. So it works downwards. So it's in the exposed concrete ceiling. And then we have a kind of minimum rise floor where we bring as well the basic fresh air into the apartments with a kind of a, a central system. So the, even the basic ventilation is mechanically, but they have operable windows. And I think what you see as well here, then it, there's an external roller shade. And that was a tricky stuff because Stephen has, you see in one of the pictures, Stephen has this colored window sills and Stephen insisted that 
you should even see the color when the shade is down, which finally made us possible to install a quite more expensive system from Europe, which is stainless steel roller shade, but it could take the curve to make the sill, the colored sill, even visible when the shades are down. Yeah, and it works great. Uh, they made so much money on this project, it's unbelievable, you know, that they, well, we won't talk about the economics, but. They, yeah, the client, I think this is yeah. as well, Steve, but Stephen, I think it's still interesting to see that the value of these apartments when they were finished then to today rise by whatever, 500%. Yeah, so amazing, it's amazing. In a certain way, the, it, it was recognized as the greenest, residential development in Beijing, and this pushed as well the price down. Right, right. And here's a project we won right after that project was opened in, in, in Shenzhen for the Vanki Center, and it was a competition. And there's just to give you a diagram of how things work in China. There's our model from July, uh, and there's the construction site one year later, I think. So, I mean, it's unbelievable. It was a horizontal skyscraper freeing up the ground, giving the landscape uh, a, a, to the public, a tropical landscape. And it was a great client, it's Wang Shu. And, but the, I mean, I couldn't believe that we got the building permit in 10 days. You know, I mean, it was an amazing process. And this was all Matthias' design. Do you want to talk about it, Matthias? Yeah, in this case as well, and certainly, on one side, connecting to the ground, but then as well, developing this ex external for this kind of uh, solar exposed facade, this kind of uh, perforated louver system where Stephen kind of in the combination in this collaboration between us and Stephen kind of developing what kind of louvers, how they should look like, how perforated they are, what is their tilt to ensure that we are minimizing the external loads. And that was a competition diagram. There was a height limit of 35 meters. And I simply said, let's just shift the building and put it all up at 35 meters. So everybody has a view of the sea. By the way, if, this, if the, we ever get a tsunami wave, it'll go right under the building. But then we give the whole landscape to the public, a tropical landscape. And there you see, is a feng shui building. You can see it's facing south and the mountains are on the north and the views to the sea, they were all maximized by this design. It floats over a tropical landscape. That was a, a concept model. But this is a key part, and I think this helped us win the competition. We had a 60,000 meter site, but when we raise the whole building over the green, we keep 60,000 square meters, and we have a green roof adding 15,000 square meters. So now we end up with 75,000 square meters of green so this is a really the most green you could make this could only be done in a tropical landscape the the it's 20 meters off the ground so the sun shines just enough to keep all the plants going nothing is in the shadow that won't let it and then the coolness of the shade of the building is something positive when walking around in this landscape inspired by carlo burley marx and there's just a diagram of some of the sea breezes coming through. Yeah. And I think this is as well, you get the shade by the building and you feel the breeze from the sea, which makes you much more comfortable standing right. in the shadow, but being still in the landscape. And that's open to the public uh, so they can use that landscape as they wish. And uh, the banking company is very generous that way. This is your diagram too, right? Mateen? Exactly. This was about uh, identifying what facades are getting the biggest load, where we need to develop this external shading system to ensure that not only by a high performance class, but by this system, and, and we choose this kind of fixed or kind of tiltable louvers we see in one of the next slides as the protection from the outside load. Right, those are the louvers, the special louvers we designed. Studying palm leaves, palm fronds, the width, exact width of a palm frond, and then reversing it, punching it into a, aluminum. 
that gave us this special feeling of the light and uh, how the shading works. And it still keeps a, a high transparency of the building because if you look at like from the sun from above, it's quite shaded. If you look from below, you can look in between the louvers. And that's another advantage we see with the solar system that with this reverse skyscraper Stephen was deciding, we get the biggest possible energy collection roof because there is no self-shading in between towers because yeah. it's all a horizontal big roof. It's all on roof on the top. Yeah. And all so this the materials were done uh, in bamboo, natural, without any additive or finishes, so that it was a kind of, uh, let's say, ecological aspect of the materials we used to finish the building. This is Wong Shu's office. And there you see a diagram. Right. And you see kind of comparing it exactly the louvers on the facade to minimize the external loads. And it was the first Li Platinum kind of uh, certified building, office building in China. Yeah, first leads to platinum building in China. They, they engraved the doors that you go in uh, to the building, the front doors with, the, with that award, but they, split, they spelled platinum wrong. So that's all right. <laughs> and these are the cores that hold the building up, the concrete cores. So I use those as light fixtures as well. And the glass is suspended off the concrete so all the plumbing chases, the services that serve the apartments and offices above come down between the core of the concrete core and that glass shade skin. Therefore, they can be serviced. And this is, this is the first geothermal project that we did, the Lake Whitney Water Purification Facility and Park. And, and, and it was in Hamden, Connecticut. And it began in 1990. It was a water purification plant, and that was my uh, that was my drawing from 1998, and that's what happens in the water for uh, uh, treatment plant: rapid mix, flocculation, dissolved flotation, clear well, ozonation. These different aspects, then I said, should come out into the landscape and become micro to macro expression in the landscape. And what happened here was, this is very early in the, in the geothermal knowledge. For us, it's our first geothermal project. And, and by the way, that's 22 years ago. But it, it's, it's because the client manager was an enlightened engineer, and he had done a geothermal well in his own house. And it worked so well, he convinced this bureaucracy of the water treatment people to do this. I mean, that was like, unbelievable you know and he convinced them of course we were behind it because we want to build everything as green as possible so it's the largest green roof in the state of connecticut it's got a gravity driven water treatment process that eliminates pumping and skylight natural skylights to all the plant spaces and there you see the michael van valkenberg's planting and the building itself is a kind of upside down teardrop and you see it's sitting in this beautiful, now it's really grown up. It's been, you know, a long time this has been open. There you see the, the pathway between the offices and the treatment plant itself. And there's an overview of, of the incredible largest green roof in the state of Connecticut. But I, I was up there a, a number of years ago. And, you know, when they did this, uh, they were nervous. So they put a conservative 88 wells, 11 pumps, and every, uh, one pump per eight wells. And we were up there on a 92 degree day, and there were only five or six pumps running. So it's completely over-designed. But anyway, that was our first, before we even started to work with Mitya Shur, but then he convinced me even after that. I mean, uh, we, we had a great client in this case, but I think now we would, we would in fact, I've turned down projects that won't go green as we want them. I think life is too short to be building anything run by fossil fuels. I think, Matthias, you have anything you want to say? We can take some questions. Yeah, I think uh, let's take some questions. Okay. We... Well, great. I just want to um, 
So this is this is David again. I'll just ask the first question, and then I'm sure we have some um, coming in um, on the chat. So if for the audience, if you have any questions, you can type them into the chat, and uh, Lila will help field those questions. But I wanted to thank you very much, um, Stephen and Matthias, for um, giving this presentation. Oh, and for, for me, it was a really fascinating context in which to see all of this work together. And I really love the way that, you know, just as you describe the site and the program and the year of the building, you're indicating the number of geothermal wells and the depth of the geothermal wells. So essentially like elevating geothermal energy to the highest level of, of a project description. I, that's amazing. Um, I wanted to just ask a quick question, though. Um, what what are some of the challenges and limitations and trade-offs in the use of these kind of geothermal systems? Um, you know, because you guys are the are the experts now. Um, are the challenges in terms of cost or climate or soil? Is there a trade-off between operational energy and embodied energy? And I guess related to that, I'm thinking. Um, what would it take to get to a, a critical mass in the adoption of geothermal systems to move the needle on global carbon emissions? Or like, like you're saying, Stephen, to just like squeeze out fossil fuels forever? Well, one, I think just one thing for sure, it's a no brainer when you're in a, client, a climate like New York or Beijing because of the swing. You can harvest the, 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 the cool in the, in the, in the, in the summer and it's, swings back and you get the warm in the winter. So, you know, it, I think people are foolish in these climates. The, the question of, of it becomes difficult when you get to the southern and, and uh, tropical climates, right, Matthias? It gets a bit, it gets a bit uh, more difficult, but I think what is interesting as well, that, okay, a geothermal system relates to the ground our buildings are built on. So it's kind of, the base of the building is as well the base of the energy system and what is clear if we want to get rid of fossil fuels we need to use the sun now if we use the sun depending on the time of the year the intensity is different so we need a storage and geothermal systems work as a perfect buffer as Stephen described this that surplus heat in winter we are dumping down improving the efficiency and reducing the urban heat island because we are not dumping the heat into our neighborhood. We are dumping it into the ground and we take it out with the delay six months later to heat our buildings. Right, so the main, the main, the main challenge is just convincing you know, not very intelligent clients that that's what they should do. Yeah, right? and it's There's a lot, One of the biggest problems we have in humanity are very small minds in high places right now. <laughs> in, right, in many ways. Many it's systems. about and it's about cost, and it's clear that compared to a gas boiler, the investment costs are much higher. But if you account over the lifetime of the building, then this is the system to go for. Yeah, that makes sense. And so, so do you bring those arguments, Stephen, in addition to your, your act of persuasion and insistence and contributing your own money? That's brilliant. Um, but do, do you bring that, the, the kind of life cycle cost? You say that, you know, a return on investment in a certain number of years is going to, you know, pay for itself? It's not, it's not even a certain number of years, you know. I mean, for example, the, the first project I showed you has a single well. It cost $14,000. We had to go through stone. It's 500 feet deep, but it heats and cools a 3,000 square foot building. Right next to it is a little house from 1945. It's running on an oil furnace. I haven't had a chance to do anything with it. In the month of January, the oil bill was $1,000. February, $900. You know, the, the, the archive the electric bill was $40. So that's the difference, okay? It's, a, it's immediately experienced in the, the, the you know, the drastic change, the difference in cost, a monthly cost. So you don't, you don't even have to argue it on, a, on like payback over how many years. It's, it's immediately evident. Yeah, that, that, makes, that makes so much sense. Um, 
So I see, I want to invite again, if, if people are listening, you can find a, the chat button at the bottom of the Zoom window and type in a question. If you have a question, I think Lila will be fielding those. So um, just looking here, pulling up the chat myself. Um, I, I wonder, um, this is probably beyond the, the scope of this presentation and lecture, but I wonder if you, if you, either of you want to speculate about this moment, taking advantage of this moment in terms of, you know, kind of like what you were saying, Stephen, the, you know, small imaginations in, in high places. I forget how exactly you put it, but is there a way we can take advantage of, of this moment to help people realize that a little bit more long-term planning and thinking well, in just terms of our architecture and our whole society. Will everything be that we're doing as a society, the example of Korea, of South Korea, the example of Taiwan, evident. Uh, both have healthy, you know, huge healthcare systems and hospital systems, and both of them have an, an enormously lower death rate and virus rate by a factor of a huge factor. I mean. Somebody did the calculation. If we had the same system going on as Taiwan, which is 24 million people, the amount of deaths in America would be 83. That's how different it is. We just need smart people to go out and, you know, and get on the, on the, on the fence and push this stupid government out, get the, the right people in that we can get the right systems going. I mean, we have the knowledge to completely be off fossil fuels. Right, right, Matthias, we did these diagrams before. Yes. The USA could completely run without fossil fuels. Yes, yes. They but it's a corrupt government that's in bed with the oil companies, you know? This is the biggest problem we have, is the political problem. It's yeah. not an engineering problem. We, we have the knowledge now. So it's the same, the same thing we're facing with the virus, you know? It's just ignorance and not listening to science. But that's not part of our lecture. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> but David, uh, David, coming back to your question, I think what we can learn is exactly on one side. Okay, we she should be better prepared, and carbon emissions, which are as well kind of um, endangering our health, they are an additional argument we should keep in mind. It's not only about today's operation cost; it's about the health for the future. Right. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, um, um, so yeah, Lila, I think you can take over. You're fielding some questions. I see them in there. So go ahead, Lila. Yeah. Um, so we have a question from James. Uh, he asks if there are policy or building code challenges. I mean, obviously, we're just speaking about sort of like the political will issue. But in terms of maybe specifically building codes um, or specific policies that you would like to address that could be changed, um, can you imagine incentive, incentives or specific policies that would encourage more widespread adoption of these types of um, technologies and practices? Matthias, can you speak to that? Yeah, I would say, okay, it's clear if, if incentives can always support a client, especially clients which are kind of only looking on the moment investment cost to support it, and often it's not, the, the amount of money, it's more than if you can argue that there is an incentive, which means there is a governmental or an institutional proof of this approach, which then helps a client to argue, even is in his own circles, to convince his own people that this is the right way to go. So I think incentives, they are often an argument support. It's less the amount of money you get by it but it's kind of supporting that we need to step another, to take another path. Just to take that a step further, um, not that you will necessarily know this immediately off of your head, but are you aware of the sort of percentage of the use of ge geothermal in the US versus Europe in terms of like overall adoption? Okay, in the northern part, uh, so like uh, 
state of New York is pretty good in, in respect of geothermal. Further, further south, the systems are not so popular uh, compared to, let's compare it. Okay, they are, I think Scandinavia is definitely the, uh, are the countries with the biggest kind of uh, application of geothermal systems. And then Central Europe, Denmark, Germany, Switzerland, a big, uh, applications of this. So there we, I would guess we are probably factors three times more systems related to the installed facilities than in, in the US. Mm -hmm. So Lila, I'm going to, I'm going to interpret a question that came in and um, I'm not sure if this is what it means, but it was, it's basically a question about implications of using geothermal systems in the design of the buildings. And I guess what I'm interpreting that to be maybe is, Stephen, do you think, are there cases where um, because of using geothermal, um, you either had to sacrifice on another design feature you were interested in, or it somehow even enhanced a design feature you were interested in? Well, I've been interested in environmental issues I, since uh, 1970, I was part of the founding member of, uh, members of environmental works at the University of Washington. So I had to take my own direction a long time ago. And I believe that thermal mass is part of this kind of strategy. And so when you look back at the 60s and certain people like Buckminster Fuller, when he says, how much does my building weigh? And it's better if it's lighter. That doesn't work. Right, Matthias? That doesn't work for geothermal. Yeah. Therefore, even from the beginning, I, I thought that architecture with a substantial mass is better. It's, it's more like a flywheel. It's, it's, it's much better. So the kind of that, that I think that attitude is in the design work and it's, it's about sustaining on a longer, on a longer line, not just being immediate gratification of, of a geometric uh, tectonic. And I think, okay, yeah. the integration often geothermal systems lead to water-based systems. So typically you try to activate the floors or the slabs, which then is dramatically reducing the air duct system. So right. the distribution system, the suspended ceiling, the hidden systems, which are in the section taking out 20, 30% of the height of the spaces are very expensive. Yes. Another way to argue with this, is if you have a, a radiant slab and you have the cost of the well and the water furnace, but don't forget the cost of the ductwork that you've eliminated. If you eliminate all that sheep uh, ductwork that's hanging around in the ceilings, we don't have any of that with the geothermal. I've been able to articulate that basically it's a wash. An oil furnace with uh, ductwork hanging all around is just as expensive as you know, a, an integral concrete slab six inches on center of the tubes floating on an insulation and a geothermal well. Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a great argument. Um, I, I had one other question I wanted to ask about um, the cooling. Um, so is, does, does the, using the geothermal for running water and cooling, um, does that, is that a little less common? Does that present some unique challenges um you know to to do both of those normally you know we might think that um you know cooling is from above but you know do we is is are there are there new rules where it just makes sense to do both heating and cooling in the floors you know this this i would say this depends and it's clear we showed uh, like the turning art museum or other museums louvre Lens, in France, that you can use in even in museums where the most load comes from people and lighting, a radiant floor for heating and cooling, even when normally you would say cooling should come from above and heating from below, that we typically today in more, let's say, residential applications, we're using the floor for heating and cooling, but in offices where typically the internal gains are much higher, we're truly using the slab because they're dominate, dominated by cooling and not by heat. So depending on the use, you either choose the slab or the floor. 